As a teacher, I often find myself disillusioned by portrayals of teachers and media. Perhaps people of any profession that requires such multifaceted and unseen work might feel this way too, but we are so often depicted in hokey and overgeneralized ways. It's an anomaly then that Dead Poet Society, the now 30-year-old film beloved by English teachers around the world, still holds up and continues to inspire and be shown in schools to this day. The main narrative of the film is a coming-of-age story of a group of elite prep school seniors, and Robin Williams' performance as the passionate Mr. Keating is undoubtedly iconic. Yet I wonder how many people have considered what we actually see from his teaching, beyond it simply being inspirational and sprinkled with quotes from famous dead poets. What I'd like to do in this video is look at Mr. Keating through the lens of the ideas of Parker J. Palmer, a scholar and educator that I've come to dearly love. I think that this movie makes for an interesting case study of Palmer's vision for great teaching, which instead of stressing specific instructional styles or management techniques, emphasizes connection, community, and hospitality in a learning space, as well as the inner lives of teachers themselves. At the onset of the film, we immediately get a sense of the qualities that characterize the prestigious Welton Academy. Schooling their boys in classical disciplines like Latin, the administrators and teachers carefully craft an atmosphere of academic rigor that ultimately aims at sending their students to the Ivy League and into high-paying careers. Well, John, the curriculum here is set. It's proven it works. Prepare them for college and the rest will take care of itself. While the school gets the results the parents pay for, there's an obvious lack of sincere interest on behalf of the students, and the teachers seem concerned mainly with rote-style teaching and assigning an overwhelming amount of homework. I find this rigid atmosphere to echo what Parker Palmer calls the pain of disconnection, the sadly common sense of detachment between teachers, their subjects, and their students. In his work, Palmer traces this problem, in part, to the foundational question of epistemology, or knowing, suggesting that much of modern education exalts what he calls objectivism. Objectivism, he says, begins by assuming a sharp distinction between the knower and the objects to be known. We move into the field of objects equipped with tools that allow us to grasp them. Then we attempt to observe and dissect the objects by means of empirical measurement or logical analysis. Not only does this kind of objectivism seem to permeate much of life at Welton, but also we learn that this is precisely the sort of knowing that had characterized the English class that Mr. Keating inherits. The first page of their textbook lays out a literal formula for measuring the greatness of poetry. And of course, what does Mr. Keating call such a system? Excrement. That's what I think of Mr. J. Evans Pritchard. We're not laying pipe, we're talking about poetry. In opposition to objectivism, knowing the truth to Parker Palmer is best compared to a relationship, the way that you can know, love, and live in communion with another person. He summarizes his view of truth like this. Truth is an eternal conversation about things that matter, conducted with passion and discipline. Good teaching, whatever its form, will help more and more people learn to speak and listen in the community of truth. On a foundational level, part of what Mr. Keating does is to widen his students' perspective on truth and knowledge, inviting them into that eternal conversation, where truth is much more than what can be measured, and where truth-seeking is a communal endeavor. However, this is not to say that truth is relative. Palmer himself said, If we regard truth as a fiction determined by personal whim, the classroom will look like anarchy. But if we regard truth as emerging from a complex process of mutual inquiry, the classroom will look like a resourceful and interdependent community. In addition, another piece of Palmer's antidote to the disconnections of objectivism is to give our subjects themselves their own voice, a voice that can speak their own truth and resist our tendency to reduce them to our terms. I think the way that Mr. Keating speaks about poetry in his classes embodies this well. He makes poetry accessible. I can also imagine maybe John Wayne is Macbeth going, Well, is this a dagger I see before me? <laughs> and he makes poetry a source of transcendent meaning and truth. You will learn to savor words and language. 
words and ideas can change the world. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. Palmer puts it this way, Students will often say that their favorite teachers are ones who are enthusiastic about their subjects, even if they are not masters of teaching technique. More is happening here than the simple contagion of enthusiasm. Such teachers overcome the student's fear of meeting this stranger, this subject, by revealing the friendship that binds subject and teacher. Students are affirmed by the fact that this teacher wants them to know and be known by this valued friend in the context of a well-established love. This is a wonderful summary of Palmer's overall vision for teaching. Real learning does not happen until students are brought into a relationship with the teacher, with each other, and with the subject. We cannot learn deeply and well until a community of learning is created in the classroom. So if a community of learning is the goal, what would an ideal environment or learning space look like? First, like anyone welcoming strangers into an authentic community, Mr. Keating treats his students with a sense of hospitality. To Palmer, hospitality in a classroom means receiving each other, our struggles, our newborn ideas with openness and care, creating an ethos in which the community of truth can form, the pain of truth's transformations be born. Yet this does not mean that Mr. Keating exists to shower them with praise and make their experience easy. I think that we can see Mr. Keating walking a fine line of seeming contradictions, doing what Parker Palmer calls inhabiting certain paradoxes. In his landmark book, The Courage to Teach, Palmer actually articulates six different paradoxes that he encourages teachers to build into their teaching. A learning space to Palmer should be bounded and open hospitable and charged, inviting the voice of the individual and the voice of the group, honoring the little stories of the students and the big stories of the disciplines and tradition, supporting solitude and surrounding it with the resources of community, and welcoming both silence and speech. So how does Mr. Keating navigate these paradoxes? In some ways, he tugs on pendulums that have swung too far in one direction, because intense boundaries are everywhere at Welton, his very first move as a teacher is to invite them outside of the classroom walls. Well, come on. To literally and symbolically open the learning space for them. Because so much of the student's individuality has been snuffed out by the expectations of their parents and their institution, he champions free thinking and free expression. I want you to find your own walk right now. Your own way of striding, pacing, any direction, anything you want. But he still walks the tightrope of paradox. He knows and addresses each student by name, but there is a communal identity that he affirms in the class. His classes are marked by hospitable dialogue, but they are still charged enough to maintain a sense of reverence for the subject. Why does the writer use these lines? Because he's in a hurry. No! Ding! Thanks for playing anyway. He encourages individuality and carpe diem, but he also invites them to find purpose and perspective in the heritage of their institution. He asks them to write their own poetry and delights in their taking up the legacy of the dead poet society, sucking the marrow out of life and expressing themselves. But he still has them write essays. He still has them read Shakespeare. His class is still very much rooted and bounded by the tradition of Western literature. The way he deals with the prank of the rebellious Charlie is a wonderful example of Mr. Keating navigating such paradoxes. What about carpe diem and sucking all the marrow out of life? Sucking the marrow out of life doesn't mean choking on the bone. Another aspect of Mr. Keating's learning space that resonates with Palmer's paradoxes is the emotional space he is able to create. Palmer contends that students' pain of disconnection and their attraction to objectivism are ultimately rooted in fear. Fear of failing, of not understanding, of being drawn into issues they would rather avoid, of having their ignorance exposed or their prejudices challenged, of looking foolish in front of their peers. These fears are most saliently illustrated in the film by Todd, whose insecurities are crippling. Some teachers might be afraid to allow the realm of emotion into the classroom. Some might even be tempted to actually maintain an atmosphere of fear. But in another push towards openness in this world of rigid boundaries, 
We see Mr. Keating guide Todd along the path towards facing his fears and finding his voice. Mr. Anderson thinks that everything inside of him is worthless and embarrassing. I think you're wrong. I think you have something inside of you that is worth a great deal. By seeing him, by listening to him, and acknowledging his fears, and by creating a learning space that accepts and affirms him and his emotions, this passage from The Courage to Teach articulates this so well. Behind their fearful silence, our students want to find their voices, speak their voices, have their voices heard. A good teacher is one who can listen to those voices even before they are spoken, so that someday they can speak with truth and confidence. Now these paradoxes are not a formula, but they are an excellent guide to the tug of war that often wages in the heart of a dedicated teacher. And it is the heart of a teacher to which Parker Palmer always returns. An emphasis on a teacher's inner life is one of the most unique aspects of Parker Palmer's vision compared to other educational thinkers, but it's unavoidable to him. For teaching, like any truly human activity, emerges from one's inwardness. Good teaching, to Palmer, cannot be reduced to technique. Good teaching emerges from a teacher's identity and integrity, a personal sense of wholeness and alliance with his or her true self. He even characterizes the work and internal dimensions that teaching involves as spiritual, which is not surprising considering that much of Palmer's perspective on community and the inner life is influenced by his roots as a Quaker. Though we don't learn much about Mr. Keating's history or personal life, I do think we can see in him this hidden wholeness that Palmer describes. A deep contentedness, a sense of higher calling and established personal identity. It's not just Mr. Keating's passion or eccentricity that capture his students' hearts. They are drawn to him, at least in part, by what they see in him. A great simple piece of evidence we see that speaks to Mr. Keating's inner life is his joy. Just take it from him. You can go anywhere, you can do anything. How can you stand being here? Because I love teaching. I don't want to be anywhere else. In The Courage to Teach, when specifying the true meaning of a vocation, Palmer cites Frederick Buchner, calling it the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Palmer goes on saying, in a culture that sometimes equates work with suffering, it is revolutionary to suggest that the best inward sign of vocation is deep gladness. Robin Williams as Mr. Keating undoubtedly exudes that deep gladness, the sort of joy that comes from a fully contented heart and purpose-filled sense of vocation. He loves teaching, he loves his students, and he maintains his heart within an institution that, to put it mildly, does not seem to share or affirm much of his approach. Palmer's emphasis on a teacher's inner life is important, and admittedly a difficult notion to wrestle with, because while it celebrates a sort of deep purpose and joy that teaching can impart, it also puts a strange amount of responsibility on teachers like me. To be sure, institutional change is important, and Parker Palmer has written at length about the political and sociological dimensions of education, but individuals can make a difference. Countless people, including myself, can point to their relationship with a single teacher as a turning point in their lives. And so, for me and any other teachers watching this, who must do our best to steward and care for our own inner lives, I'll leave us with this final word. The transformation of teaching must begin in the transformed heart of the teacher. Only in the heart searched and transformed by truth will new teaching techniques and strategies for institutional change find sure grounding. Only in such a heart will teachers find the courage to resist the conditions of academic life while we work and wait for institutional transformation and do the sort of teaching that can help reform our students, our schools, and our world as well.